there a connection between science and spirituality? There needs to be. And this is going to be the biggest paradigm shift in the history of humanity. Because right now, science has taken the position of materialism. And because we're using life force energy as a bridge between science and spirituality, I can teach people how to align somebody else without touching them. That's a real thing that can be measured. But the energy itself can't be measured because it's non-physical. And that drives the scientists crazy. Hi, everybody. I have such a treat for you today. I've been waiting for this chat for a while. I've got Richard Gordon on, and he's an energy healer. So we'll have lots to chat about, Richard. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate being here. You bet. Oh, my honor to have you. Well, everybody, let me tell you a little bit about Richard. Richard Gordon is a visionary and a pioneer with more than 40 years of experience in the field of energy medicine. Richard's a best-selling author, the founder of the Quantum Touch Organization, and speaks internationally at medical centers, conferences, and chiropractic colleges. So, that is a very brief introduction for somebody who's been in this field for 50 years. I've been in it 30 years, mm -hmm. and you've been in it 50. So yeah. we, we have watched it change. We were, before we started rolling the tape, we were talking about that you mentioned that you have these breakthroughs, and I was responding with, yes, I see more sophisticated healings all the time, and I find that fascinating. And just, just when I think, oh, yeah, I've seen pretty much everything before. Nope. Mm -hmm. Spirit comes in and goes, yeah, not so much, sister. And so then yep. I, uh, I, get my, I get my chain yanked. So let's just get right into it. What's life force energy? The Chinese talk about chi. In India, it's prana. In Greece, it's pneuma. And in Latin, it's spiritus. What do you call it and what is it? You know, Beverly, Dr. Beverly Rubick found 70 odd words that different cultures use for this animating current of life. And that's what it is. It's the current that differentiates from something living and not living. But I think it's much more than that. I think it's a bridge to spirit. I think it's a bridge to spirituality. And the life force energy can be harnessed very, very easily by novices just by feeling your body and doing deep breathing and moving, learning how to move sensation through your body, you're actually able to move this life force energy. And then as you raise your vibration through resonance and entrainment, if you hold a high vibration and you hold a field of energy around somebody else, their body will entrain to your vibration. And that life force energy operates with an intelligence that's far beyond human understanding. We can't even begin to understand how this energy works. And we've seen so many miracles over the years with this energy. But unlike the traditions of the Chinese or the yogis, we don't have a tradition. So we're free to explore and make discoveries that other people haven't seen. So we see a series of phenomenon that first day students can access that haven't even been written about in any of these other textbooks. Interesting, interesting thought. I, ha I haven't ever considered that before, that we are kind of free to discover whatever. And, and it brings to mind one of my dear friends is a retired entrepreneur professor. She started the entrepreneur program at Southern Cal. Mm -hmm. And she used to say to me, you need to go get your MBA. And I'm a serial entrepreneur and an inventor. And I'd say, nice. I don't want to get my MBA. And she'd say, why not? And I said, I don't want my mind to be in a box, that that's how I have to do something. I said, I'm way better off hiring MBAs to work with me, but I'm the one that comes up with the ideas and the concepts. And now that she's a professor emeritus, I think she's starting to see what I was talking about. But I think that that very much applies to what you just mentioned, that we're not boxed in in a way that it has to be done or a certain way that it, that it can only be. I think that's a really good point. I remember one time I was giving a lecture at one of these whole life expos in San Francisco. And I told the, class, I told the audience of about 100 people, look, 
I can say all the words, but you're not going to know how good this is unless you experience it. So after I finish the lecture, I'm going to give everybody two or three minutes of energy. If you just get in a line, I'll just get to you and eventually you'll get it. And this man kept coming out and watching me work from time to time. Every 20 minutes, he'd come by and watch me work. And when finally I got down to a few people, he said, I studied with Qigong masters in China. They're exhausted after 15 or 20 minutes. But you look tired before you started talking, and now you're like completely energized. I said, well, I'm not using my own energy. I'm constantly bringing in more energy. He says, you, you look totally vibrant now. And I touch people and they jump, because the longer you work, the stronger the energy gets. And that's out of love and loyalty. You see, which person apprenticing with a Qigong master would say, well, master, you're coming up with a very limited concept of the energy that you have to use your own energy out of love and loyalty, you would never say a thing like that. But if you were free to explore, you go, oh, I don't have to use my own energy. I can constantly pull in more energy and raise my vibration higher and higher throughout the session. That's why these traditions are often extremely limited because they've only taken in what the master has told them instead of getting access to information directly from source. Well, I... Absolutely concur with that. I will normally talk to usually five clients a day and mm -hmm. then do my other stuff. And people say, aren't you exhausted at the end of the day? I'll say, no, I'm jazzed. Great. You know, aren't you exhausted after doing this? No, I'm jazzed because it's spirit working through me and with me and it energizes me. And I can be in a less than optimal frame of mind. Boy, as soon as I get on the phone with a client, as soon as I get on, you know, to do my show, boy, my energy is raised. Boom. I'm there. I'm having a ball. It's joy. Yes. And so when we say, how do you pick an energy practitioner to work with? And what I would say is exactly what you said. I'd say, ask them how they feel after a long day. Oh, I sacrificed myself to care for other people. Run like hell. If they say, I'm so charged. I'm, I have trouble sleeping sometimes. I'm so energized from the work. Great. Schedule yourself to be the last person that day because their energy is going to get stronger and stronger throughout the day. And that's a way to determine which kind of practitioner to work with. You are the first person I have ever had agree with me on that, ever. There you go. So, like minds, right? Yes. What's the difference between life force energy and electromagnetic energy? What, vast, ele what vast, physicists and electricians? Yes, vast differences. Electromagnetism and light both fall off with distance. So they call it the inverse square law. The further you are away, it falls off inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So if you are five feet away from a light bulb or an electromagnetic source, you have twice the energy as if you were seven feet away. The square of five is 25, the square of seven is 49. So you have half as much light or electromagnetism the further you are, you are away. But I could do energy healing across the planet or any distance, and distance doesn't matter at all because it's not electromagnetic. And a lot of people want to believe that the life force energy is just some form of electromagnetism, but it's clearly not the case because it's a spiritual energy that, it, that love is not limited by distance or time, and you can send your energy anywhere at any time you want to send it. So the life force energy is is, is really spiritual, and the physical can be measured, but the spiritual can't. I agree. I always tell people, I could find you if you're on Mars or in a different right. solar system or wherever. Yeah. It doesn't matter. And it and it is interesting how I know you've experienced this many times, as have I, when clients will say, oh, I can feel that. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, yeah. And they're you know, they're like in Australia or someplace. Absolutely. And I'm in Alabama. I'm in the U.S. Where yeah. are you? Are you in California? Actually, I'm in uh, San Miguel, Mexico. Okay, so Mexico. But yeah. that's a long way to get to that person. And But it's instant, it's you instant. know, connecting into them. The heart knows no distance. Right. You can love Let's somebody from far away just as well as you can love them if they're right next door. Yeah, good point. Good point. What's what's at the intersection of matter and consciousness? What I call the great mystery. It's, it's impenetrable that 
I figured out a way to explore the intersection of matter and consciousness to some extent, and I wrote a book about it called The Secret Nature of Matter. I had this outlandish experience. I'm going to have to backtrack a little bit. I learned back in 1978 that you could use breathing and body awareness and touch somebody's hips and they'd roll back to alignment with a light touch. And it's a fun thing to show people because it's something instant they can see, they can measure it, they know something happened. Even if they don't have a major condition, you can align the hips or even the cranial bones. You can get the occiput back here to align when it's uneven. And people can even feel it on themselves if it's very uneven. So then about 30 some years later, I found out I could meditate and cause that alignment to occur. And then soon after that, maybe another seven or nine years after that, I found out that I could put consciousness into any kind of physical object, glass, plastic, rubber, paper, uh, pebble, feather, you name it, all physical objects can hold energy and intention. Well, how could I possibly test that? Oh, I just touch them with intention and either their hips untwist and the occiput untwist or it doesn't. A little bit of a story how all the steps that led to that discovery, but I can get a yes or no answer that way. Well, then I started doing a whole series of experiments I wrote about in a book called The Secret Nature of Matter, where I'd say, well, if I boil water for 20 minutes, will it still hold the information to cause what I call spontaneous postural alignment of the hips and cranial bones? And it did. But what about the water that evaporated to the lid of the pot? Nope, that water didn't cause spontaneous postural alignment, SPA. And then what about water that turned to ice? It lost the information. But what about ice that I charged that turned back to water? That worked. And so I ran about 60 experiments to find out when and what was happening. And I discovered something totally remarkable I call conscious entanglement, where you can join objects together in the mind and then whatever happens to one of the objects spontaneously happens to all the objects at once. And so I got to show some of this to a group of scientists at the University of Arizona. I got invited to a lab meeting. So I've got a whole room full of scientists. They said, what did you discover? How did you come up with it? And I went and told them the story. They said, well, we got to see this. So I had people measuring each other's hips. And it was like this. And then I touched them with an object I had meditated on. I touched their shoulder and said, boing, which was my magic word. And uh, they'd measure and say, let me see that. Oh, it's really out. Let me see it now. Looks totally even. So we had four people each measuring seven different people who were in the room. And after about seven or eight minutes, they all said, there's no doubt this works. There's no doubt this is real. And four of them said they wanted to research and publish. And then they bragged about the MRI, CT scans, ultrasound, and other special equipment they had. And then the first guy said, but you know, if I publish, I know I'll never get tenure at the university. And number two, three, and four said, yeah, if I study this and publish, it'll be academic suicide. And then the head professor said he knew of no university anywhere in the world that would be open to these discoveries. He compared me to a long list of famous scientists who couldn't be appreciated while they were alive. And then said, well, good luck. And what I found out was that there's fear of people looking at a new paradigm. Just like 400 years ago, the priests had to see that the universe, that the world was geocentric, that the whole universe went around the earth. And then when Galileo come along, he says, well, you know, actually it's heliocentric. We're all going around the sun. And that was an untenable idea to the priests 400 years ago. But right now, the idea that we live in a spiritual reality where love has an impact on the outer world, that consciousness is not just thoughts in the head or a sentiment on a greeting card, but a real energy that can change the outer reality, that breaks the paradigm and everybody ran away but it's still available for any courageous scientist who's not afraid to step out of line. And I'm happy to repeat these experiments and let the cards fall where they will, let them be empirical, report what's true. We will get to objects holding energy. I wanna to get to that in a minute, but before we get there, you say love is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And so I wanna know, like the late great Tina Turner, What's love got to do with it? Everything. I, the more I, I study this work, I mean, 
the work with quantum touch allows ordinary people to see extraordinary healing session. We had a joke where, you know, we're constantly saying, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. Every time something amazing happens, the functional definition of a miracle, by the way, is when something happens that far exceeds your expectations, whether there's a grand miracle or a tiny one. So uh, the students started having their own groups gathering together after workshops, and they started inviting new people to come into the room, and they'd see such extraordinary healings on such a common basis. Somebody came up with the idea, well, we can't keep calling it a miracle if it happens every week. So they came up with a new word that I really like. They called it a normical. When miracles become normal, they call them normicals. But ultimately, when you learn to use the breathing and body awareness, there's no attunements, there's no magic symbols, there's no woo that we're adding to it. You have the ability already. You do the breathing, the body awareness, and the love. That's the secret ingredient. And the more a person surrenders to that love, along with the breathing, the body awareness, you've got to keep the breathing going because it keeps you from ro- lowering your vibration to let them come up to you. You never want to come down to match them. They have to keep coming up to match you. And you keep raising your energy. So through resonance and entrainment, their body does its own healing. We like to say the definition of a healer is someone who was sick and got well. And a great healer was someone very sick who got well quickly. So quantum touch teaches you how to lift your vibration to let the other person entrain to you. But here's a great secret. The deeper you can connect with your love while you do it, the faster the healing tends to go. So we have a technique that's aptly called the what you love most technique. So if you have a a daughter or a cat or a husband or a person or a, a Jesus or whatever it is that that just totally opens up your heart, you connect with that and you inspire your love to a deeper level and then you do the breathing and body awareness while you're holding that vibration and we see radically accelerated healing. So what does love have to do with it? It's the centerpiece of it all. I agree. How'd you get interested in energy healing? Did you grow up in a hippie commune or something like that? my, My parents were both atheists. And I kind of thought that I felt that way too at first. And then by the time I was in college, I thought, well, maybe I'm a non-theist. In other words, why push against something I don't believe is there? So I said, well, if God knocks on my door, I'll pay attention. And I got my door blown down so many times. I had to keep opening myself up to what's really true. And and with like a silent prayer in the heart, like I really want to know what's true. I really want to know what's true. For hours, just holding the space. And then I was guided to uh, some fantastic information, wonderful teachers. And then I was allowed, I was able to have my own insights based on many experiences. And over the years, I've had a series of breakthroughs, one after another after another, leading me to where I am now. And how do you know it's a breakthrough? Just because of what you witness in a healing or you feel differently Uh, or you think differently? uh, How do you know something's a breakthrough? When you are able to do things you never imagined possible previously on a whole new level. Such as? So what's an example? For example, the first breakthrough was discovering polarity therapy. And I wrote about something I created called the Polarity Circle in my book called Your Healing Hands, The Polarity Experience. That, that what came out in 1978, by the way. And it's the most amazing thing. You get six people, it's inconvenient to teach and it's inconvenient to set up, but you got six people working on one person, you see mind-blowing healing sessions that are just so off the charts. I can tell you story after story. Then the second breakthrough was when I learned how to start running energy consciously. And then I would see like bones moving back to alignment with a light touch and somebody's scoliosis straightening out and just crazy things. That was the basis of quantum touch. And then 30 odd years later, that's how long it took me to figure something out, I realized we could work more powerfully at a distance many times than even with local touch. And I could align people simultaneously, like a whole group of people without touching. That was the level two quantum touch. That was another breakthrough. And But I became disturbed because some people were getting better during the sessions, but they get right back to where they were soon after it. In other words, it wasn't lasting. So it took me a little over 30 years to figure out a system that I call self-created health. This is a way for people to discover the emotional causes 
of why they had the condition. I have a concise method for discovering emotional cause. And it, it's an interrogative question. It isn't paint by numbers like Louise Hay and others say, well, this means this. No, we don't do that at all. We are able to do it in such a way that a person absolutely knows what the emotional cause is for themselves. I don't know their story. They know their story. And not only do symptoms go away, but people can feel intensely grateful that they had had the condition because when they're on the other side, they realize that it was just a grand setup of love to learn how to love better. And that was the, uh, the fourth breakthrough. Then the fifth breakthrough was like the discovery of the intersection of matter and consciousness that I could charge a feather or a piece of wood or a pebble or a crystal or just a, any kind of object and touch somebody with it and instantly untwist their hips and cranial bones. That's widely considered to be physiologically impossible. And I ran uh, almost 60 experiments where I discovered something outlandish I call conscious entanglement, where you can join objects together in your mind and they'll all function as a single object. And it's a long story, but anyway, that, that whole area I called one breakthrough. And then after that, I discovered how you can hack the law of attraction. Everybody says, imagine what you want, believe you have it, live as if it's true. Well, that's called lying to yourself. That's not attracting, that's acting as if. And you're going to fool the universe. So I wrote a book called Hacking the Law of Attraction for Effortless Manifestations. And that was a breakthrough because I was able to attract things to myself un unfathomable proportion through allowing that future to love me, not trying to make it happen. So I went into a yin state of allowance, and so I discovered how to teach people to allow. That was another breakthrough. And the last breakthrough happened a few months ago. It started 14 years ago when I was hanging out with my friend Carolyn in a cafe, and she was explaining to me that she had a photographic memory and she never had to study well in college. And I told her, well, I had to study like crazy because I got a crappy memory. And I just remember the terms. I did, didn't do great. And she, I said, why don't you give me your photographic memory? Now, I'm just goofing around. And so I, she said, well, how do I do that? I said, I don't know. Just grab hold of your memory, put it inside my head. And as I'm going to bed that night, I don't think about any of that stuff, but I'm thinking of a friend I hadn't seen in years, and all of a sudden there's his face right in front of me as if printed in the air in light, was crystal clear with the name spelled in gold letters underneath. I thought of a second and third friend, printed in the air, gold letters. I'm thinking, wow, it's amazing. I'm reading the letters forwards and backwards, and they don't move. I've never had a visualization like this. And just while I'm thinking, Wow, that was so much fun. My body was racked in fear. It took me an hour to go to sleep. I was so, my adrenaline was all rushing. So when I saw Carolyn a couple of days later, I said, when you think of people you haven't seen in a while, do you suddenly see their face right in front of you with a name spelled in gold letters? Now, that's not a question I ask most people. <laughs> and she said, how did you know? She says, I'm like a machine. You know, it just automatically happens. And then I said, you carry a lot of fear, don't you? Oh, you have no idea how much fear I have. Well, what I realized, we could share the gifts with each other, but it took me 14 years to figure out how to do it efficiently, and I figured it out now. And we, how many flavors of love are there? We don't have words for this. How would you describe the scent of a rose or a jasmine? We don't have words for that. But people have all these different qualities of love. You can think of the chakras, the love is safety and security, love is pleasure, love is emotional openness and acceptance and joy, pure adoration. And we go through all the chakras and realize how many varieties of love are each of those. Maybe there's hundreds or thousands of qualities of love. I found out how to experience other people's states of consciousness directly, how to share the gifts with each other. And that's going to be a new workshop I just created. I'm going to do it for the first time in October. And how people can directly share all the most beautiful positive states with each other, not just now, but throughout time. And what I found is my level of gratitude and joy has gone up at least 500% since I discovered this technique. That we can access more. And what if, okay, a friend shares something with me that's just so beautiful and I don't let this in my life the way he does, but what if I let 3% in? 
wow, that feels better than what I did before. What if next week I can let 5% in? It doesn't go away. And so I found this thing that's going to be, it's one of the greatest psychological tools I ever imagined that we can actually experience the gifts of other people directly and become more. And that's the name of the seminar, Becoming More. And I don't even know how far this is going to go, but it is a massive opening. And that's why I call it a breakthrough. Because I, I studied this for 14 years to figure out how we can actually do it. And it required understanding what I call spiritual anatomy and how do we actually receive the gift once we have gotten it. How do we actually let it in? And how do we let it in more and more ongoingly? And that's what the whole workshop's going to be. Fascinating. I, I think that it's interesting, too, how you are, you're, allowing this stuff. It's like you're tuning into a different vibration each time. I think of it as different stations on a satellite TV mm -hmm. or on a, a um, radio. You know, you tune to a different station, but you've got to have your amps up to a certain level in order to access those new stations. Uh, well, my friend Charles said that, Richard, he may be slow, but he's dumb. I mean, if you consider... I first witnessed that I could align people in 1978 when my first book came out. And it took me over 30 years to figure out that I could do it without touching. So I, I get hints of things and then when I'm finally ready, I get the rest of the insight and then it opens up and opens up. And uh, I expect there'll be a few more breakthroughs before I leave, but you never know when they come. Sometimes I wait decades before I get the next major insight. But when they come, it's, it's overwhelming because it opens up a higher level of freedom and possibility. And what are humans capable of? We don't even know what we are. We're just at the earliest stages of this growth and development. Yeah, I agree. Is there a connection between science and spirituality? There needs to be. And this is going to be the biggest paradigm shift in the history of humanity. Because right now, science has taken the position of materialism. If you can't explain it with math, physics, logic, known mechanisms, you have to have a known mechanism. How did this get from here to here? We don't even want to know about it. We don't want to think about it. That's the mechanistic view of reality. And spirituality is the realization that we're connected but it's ineffable you can't nail it down and because we're using life force energy as a bridge between science and spirituality i can teach people how to align somebody else without touching them that's a real thing that can be measured but the energy itself can't be measured because it's non-physical and that drives the scientists crazy because they think everything real can be measured well that's an assumption and science wants to get away from assumptions. Just like dark energy and dark matter can't be recognized or spotted physically, but we have a name for them to explain why galaxies don't fly apart and why the universe is expanding at an ever faster rate. We don't have no idea what they are, but we have a name for it. We have a name for the life force energy, prana, chi, ki, whatever words we use for it. However, we can see what the energy does. And, w and I think Nikola Tesla said the day that scientists are willing to study the non-physical will make more progress in a decade than we made in the last hundred years. I fully believe that, but it's going to take a whole paradigm shift because right now they're afraid. They're afraid to explore this. And I've outlined s almost 60 simple experiments that they can do, and I'm happy to be challenged or validated Let's publish it. And by the way, if anybody's watching this and you know how to measure posture, you're a chiropractor, osteopath, or physical therapist, and you want to put this to a little test, contact me through Quantum Touch, and we'll set up a Zoom call. You can measure people. I'll align them. Boing. That's all, how long it takes to do it. Now, just a wave of the finger and the word boing. And you can say whether it worked or not, and we'll publish it regardless of outcome. Because what I want to do is create momentum for people to study this intersection of matter and consciousness. 
Is it more financial reasons why the scientists don't want to study this stuff? You brought up the bit about the funding from big pharma and other big companies uh, to the universities and that it would be career suicide if some of them studied that. How much does that play into the equation? I think that's at the core of it because if you look at the major TV networks, the news shows, they're all funded by the major pharmaceutical companies. The universities are funded by industry. And, you know, the medical industry is not going to be happy about people being able to heal themselves faster. We had a nurse working at a hospital and she was working on post-surgical care patients and the doctor said, you have to stop doing that on the patients, meaning quantum touch. She said, why? He said, well, we can't predict how much pain medication to give them anymore. Translation, we can't sell them drugs. So the, the pharmaceutical industry, the surgery industry, the, all the different ways, it, okay, Another way of thinking is if we really had super nutrition, emotional process work, and energy healing widespread, we'd probably cut the cost of medicine by 80 to 90 percent because these solutions are available. But who wants to implement them? Uh, my friend wanted to create a business where we, we were going to call it the zero pain clinics, where have a big sign, zero pain clinic. No, you're not allowed to say that. That's a medical claim you're not allowed to say what's true. We had to take down all the testimonials from our website because the medical mafia started calling testimonials medical claims. This is insane. These are just people talking about their, their severe burns that stop hurting and thousands of stories. We had to take them all off the website and make the whole thing into pablum because the medical police say, no, we can't have any competition. It's Wikipedia t t calls chiropractic, acupuncture, Ayurvedic medicine, energy healing, holistic medicine, pseudoscience. They're all suddenly pseudoscience to discredit everything that isn't traditional Western medicine. So there's this war going on between the alternatives and the mainstream that has the monopoly on the money. Well, and it's interesting, too, because all the all the pseudosciences, in air quotes, yes. have all been around way longer than Western medicine, yes. as we know it. And I believe that the concept resonates with most people. They even if they don't want to admit it, they they know that there's something there. And I use the example of EKGs and EEGs. And I say, what, what are they measuring? Well, they're measuring the heart outside of the body. Mm -hmm. They're measuring the brain outside of the body. How's that work? Well, we use electrodes and we do this and this. Yeah, but what are they picking up outside of the body? And do you find that too? That I, I know for me, I have so many clients that come to me who've been to see many, many practitioners yeah. and they still have the same symptoms and they're just at their wits end because they're in pain or they have other ailments that are just really interrupting their lives. And they say, I, I never would talk to somebody like you. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, but I'm, I'm just out of options. And so I'm willing to try this. I know you've heard that many yeah, times. Th this is a very common story where the holistic practitioner is the last one to see the patient. So when I went to see Dr. C. Norman Sheely, the founding president of the American Holistic Medical Association, he said, the only reason I invited you is because Elmer Green told me to. I'll do anything the man says. He was one of the fathers of biofeedback. So I go in there and I'm working on his nurse, his secretary, his accountant, and his, you know, his nurses there. And, and everybody I work on like instantly feels better. You know, their pain disappears and so forth. He said, well, I think some of them might have liked you a little bit. Some of them might have been open to what you were doing. He said, I don't have to do a double blind on everything. I just have to make the test so rigorous. I can't believe anything but the outcome. So what he does is he... Uh, brings in his most difficult chronic pain patients with 20 and 30 years of constant pain who have never been helped by any traditional or alternative therapy. So I teach his staff how to start using the breathing and energy awareness 
through the body and how to do the process. And we give every one of his difficult chronic pain patients a one hour session. And what he saw was that there was a, a lasting 10 days later, 30 to 70% reduction of their pain of every one of these patients. So he got excited and he you know, called my work the first technique that may truly allow us all to become healers. And there's, there's so much more, but this is such a basic human ability that's been denigrated or ignored by the traditionalists, partly because they don't want competition, partly because it violates their assumptions about reality. Like I said, just like 400 years ago, they didn't want to understand the optics in a telescope and how to look through a telescope and understand what you're seeing. And today, they don't want to explore the possibility that we live in a spiritual reality because it violates all their fundamental assumptions about, about science. But when they can finally bridge them together, which is one of my goals, I'd love to see like a billion dollar institute to not only do the research on all the holistic approaches, but then to publicize them and get them into schools and get them out into the world. It's not enough to do the research. You actually have to bring it out into the world. So that's one of my dreams is to actually get this stuff properly researched sufficiently that we really know what's the best solutions for the problems and then to have them implemented and utilized. Because when we redefine what it is to be a human being and you realize you're the spiritual entity who has a capacity of love beyond your imagination, that our pain and wounding is deeper than we want to know, but the love goes deeper than we can know, and the love has a power to it beyond anything. We don't know who and what we really are. We're these spiritual beings identified as being some kind of broken person. Most people feel that way, but we can heal the stuff and we can leave the past behind. And that's one of the things I'm excited about my new work because it seems to heal a wounded ego. You see, negative ego operates out of self-pity or self-importance. I'm the most important person in the world, but people don't appreciate me good enough. That's the ultimate negative ego statement. But if you're filled with joy and gratitude, you can't even find self-pity unappreciated, misunderstood, overburdened, hopeless and helpless, innocent of wrong, wrongdoing. You can't even go there, nor do you have any inclination to feel better than others. We're just having a good time. I want to embrace you and see if we can be friends. That's the healthy ego. The unhealthy ego plays in the pain body of self-pity and self-importance. Outside validation as a substitute for internally based self-esteem. But this new technique lets people leave the past behind because you're so filled with the gifts of other people. And as you learn to let them in, you just get happier and happier. Now, if people are ready to let the past go, this is going to be, that's my breakthrough, which is how we can actually access these states of consciousness and let other people give us the gifts of who they've become and who they are. And I didn't know I could love this way. And that's the exciting thing. Back to putting energy into objects. Yes. Do you believe that, or it, believe, has it been your experience that objects do carry a person's energy, for instance, jewelry or other things that have belonged to people? Have you experienced that? And yeah. how does that work? I came up with this scientific technical term, I call it God stuff. Everything, all matter is made of God stuff. I know it's very technical. And it's, you see, the, the all that is, all matter, the subatomic particles and everything is made of the consciousness of the all that is. And if you have an object and you, and you care about that object, it will pick up your energies over time. And I saw somebody you know, holding different objects and saying, okay, I'm like this woman, she, uh, she was doing a demonstration and people put their objects into a, a big bag and she pulls something out. She said, you know, she's holding a watch and she's feeling it. She goes, okay, I, oh, oh, there's a beard. 
oh, and, and, and a bald head. And she's kind of like feeling her way through. And I thought, I wonder if I could do that. And sure enough, when he said, okay, whose watch is this? And the guy raised his hand blushing because that's exactly who he was. And I met this woman at a cafe one day and she had this little tiny ring on her finger. So I said, can I hold it and, and feel what's there? And it was embarrassing. I said, it's like you're living in hell and there's no way to get out. And she just burst out crying, how did you know? That was her life. But I picked it up, it took me hours to get out of that vibration by bringing myself in to feel what was in the object. So all objects can hold energy and intention. And if you can put your love and gratitude into objects, other people who are sensitive can begin to pick that up and feel it. And the importance of this is to really understand who and what we are and the nature of the reality. Not so much that I want to go around holding people's objects, but it is it, it does exist. It is a real thing. I've told this story before that when, after my mother died, I brought her china and crystal home to my house and put her crystal in a cabinet that was on the feng shui financial line okay. in my home. And I could see the energy. And once that mm. crystal went in there, the energy started doing weird stuff. Mm. And so I called my feng shui gal. I said, what's up with this? And she said, well, what's in that cabinet? Have you changed anything? And I said, yeah, I put my mom's crystal in there. And she said, well, how did your mom feel about money? And I said, there was never enough. Uh oh. And she said, get it out of there. Yeah. I was like, what am I going to do with that? I want to keep it. And she said, box it up and put it on the lower level of your home, which I did. And Richard, instantly the energy went back to normal. Instantly. And I thought, she didn't handle, this was her good crystal that she brought out for holidays or a special occasion. She didn't, it wasn't like her wedding ring, but it comes, it brings to mind at her funeral, I had on her wedding band mm -hmm. and it felt like, like one of those uh, jokester buzzers, you know, that you could, that they used to put in somebody's hand and it yes. would buzz your hand. Yes. The magicians would do that. Yeah. And I was sitting next to my dad and I said, oh my God, mother's ring is just like vibrating like crazy. And he, I took it off and he felt it and he couldn't feel anything, but I put it back on my finger. It was like, holy Moses, this was just vibrating like crazy. So yeah, yeah it's interesting how different objects hold people's energy. How do you put energy into an object on purpose? Well, Is it about the intentional actually, part? Actually, it's just using basic quantum touch. So as I said, we learn how to move awareness through our body in waves, and we learn how to link the awareness with our breathing, and we use various breathing techniques. So if you were doing a healing session, you could bring the energy through your body into your hands, or I can just hold an object with the intention of putting energy into that object and that object will hold it. And so when I did the, okay, here's a funny story. I was in a famous cafe in Santa Monica, the Bulletproof Cafe, Dave Asprey's yeah. place. And I had played golf in the morning and I reached in my sweater and there was a golf tee. I go, oh, that's interesting. So I had a stupid idea and I love stupid ideas, by the way. So what I did was I held the golf tee and as if I was going to align somebody's sphenoid bone and cause the hips and cranial bones to align, I did the same technique but into the golf tee as if it was a person. I thought, well, that's a silly idea. And I handed the golf tee to somebody and instantly their hips and cranial bones were aligned in one second. I go, no, that can't be true. And then I did it a second, third, tenth time and it worked every time. It aligned their hips and aligned their cranial bones in one second. And that's why I started doing like these 60 experiments to find out when does it work, when doesn't it work, why does it work, and so forth. And I got to make all the discoveries I put in my book, The Secret Nature of Matter. But it all started with a golf tee. I mean, a little piece of wood that I had no idea I was going to suddenly hit another breakthrough. But it was a way to explore the intersection of matter and consciousness. And all matter was equally able. I mean, people think, well, I have to get the right quartz crystal. No, piece of plastic. The plastic lid on the coffee cup worked just as well as the golf tee or the pebble outside or the feather I found. Everything worked. And, and so it astounded me that this is a real big discovery 
that the scientists don't want to know about because it would change all their fundamental beliefs. Cognitive dissonance is a bitch. I don't think that's a direct quote from Galileo, but I'm sure he's had that thought. I'm sure he had too while he was rotting in jail, right? Well, he oh my didn't gosh. have to go to jail. They showed him the torture equipment they would use if he didn't recant. He said, just a joke. I didn't really mean it. But he lived the last, what, 12 years of his life under house arrest. Yeah. And um, the, he wrote this letter. He said, my dear Kepler, when the learned steadfastly refuse to look through the telescope, what shall we make of this? Shall we laugh or shall we cry? And that's it. It's yeah. both funny and tragic that you can know something and you can't tell people about it. Well, and then the astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson says, just because you don't believe something doesn't mean it isn't real. I love that quote. And it's so profound and yeah. so applicable in this discussion. But I can't, get, the, I can't get Neil to look through my telescope. <laughs> Back to the golf tee, when doesn't it work? Well, for instance, if I take the golf tee and I burn it up and it's just ashes, it will have lost the information. If I run energy into water and boil it, when it cools, it still works. But the water that evaporated in the lid of the pot didn't work anymore. It had changed state and it didn't work. The water turning to ice lost the information and didn't work but if i charged an ice cube and then when the water melted tried that water out it did work so what i'm seeing is that sometimes when things change from one state to another it's able to hold the information like ice to water or from water to vapor lost it from water to ice lost it so i would love other people to challenge validate whatever they want you know disprove my my findings, but as yet I can't find anybody willing to repeat my experiments except for my students who have said everything they, I said in the book seems to continue working for them when they tested it. So they tried to repeat my experiments and, and I had no agenda when I did the experiment. I don't know what to expect. Either it works or it doesn't. And I got to see what, what happened when I did these things. Yeah. So what's your hypothesis of why would it work if it went from ice to water, but not from water to ice? I, th I think that when the crystallization process happened of it becoming ice, it lost the information somehow. But when it went from ice to water, it, was, it wasn't as structurally difficult for it to maintain the information. When it evaporated, it changed state so deeply from water to vapor back to water again, it wasn't able to keep the information. So let's call it energy information just as a starting point. And when it changes state, it's possible to erase the information. Hmm. What I'm getting on that is that when it went from water to ice, the information was rearranged. It was all there, but it was in a different format and kind of like yes and possibly not enough so it would still show itself to work right right but but when you put the information into the ice yeah and then it melted that's remained constant mm -hmm. that's what i'm yeah. getting i don't know if that's true or not, i don't but either that's but that's, what, that's the fun of getting some yeah, real I scientists agree. to to really challenge and take apart these experiments and find out was richard right I, look, I'm not attached to being right. I just want other people to really explore this stuff and, and validate or, or say it didn't, wasn't true. It seems to me that you're doing a lot of work with musc musculoskeletal yes. uh, parts of the body. If and is, and is, it, is that the root cause of everything no, or is no, it no, just no. skeletal? No. You see, 99% of the work that I teach is to accelerate the body's self-healing potential. It's to bring down pain, inflammation, get the body healing itself faster, whether it's a burn or what injury or and whatever it is. The body, you know, liver enzyme levels were way out of balance and you bring them back into balance. Or you work with an infant with severe fetal alcohol syndrome that becomes above average intelligence when prognosis was a 20 to 40 IQ. I talk too much about it because I'm excited. 
I talk about the structural thing because it's something I can see in one second. I can measure, looks like this, a second later, looks like that. And so the structural stuff is less than 2% of why people love quantum touch. We love it because we can help other people. We can work on friends and family or whatever, uh, clients, and be able to see miracles. That's why people like it. What I like about it is what it reveals about the intersection of matter and consciousness and who we really are as spiritual beings. And I use the postural thing as a way of getting yes or no answers, but not because I think it's the most significant part of the healing work. Most of it's about bringing down pain and accelerating the body to do what it wants to do for its own healing. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Many physicians and medical providers and sports trainers and others have taken my training and they integrate these principles and concepts into their work, but they're doing it undercover. One in particular told me, and she works for a huge medical system, enormous, mm -hmm. and she got reprimanded because she suggested vitamins to a patient. And so I think it's fascinating that we're having to, to in the medical profession, keep this stuff undercover to your mm -hmm. point earlier so that they don't get in trouble. Yeah. And, and I believe also that nobody heals anybody else. We all heal ourselves. Exactly. And so the work that you do, the work that I do, any medical provider, we're helping the person facilitate healing of their own body. I like to use the example of when somebody has surgery at the end of the procedure, the surgeon will close the incision with sutures or staples. The surgeon doesn't make the person's skin grow back. The person makes their own skin grow back. And I think that's a good example of what's going on. What do you have to say about that? Do you believe the same thing? Yeah, all healing is self-healing. As I mentioned, the definition of a healer was someone who was sick and got well. And a great healer was very sick and got well quickly. The practitioner learns to hold a high energy of vibration, love, connection, whatever it is, and the other person matches the vibration, and then the healing happens through resonance and entrainment. And the practitioner of quantum touch learns to continually raise their energy throughout the session so the other person comes up and matches their vibration, and the body and spiritual intelligence is the one doing the healing not the practitioner. So anybody who says, I'm a great healer, is either egotistical or uninformed because it's their body that's doing the self-healing. I agree. Do all energy healings immediately integrate into the body? No. Sometimes it takes a person a while before they're able to receive it. We've seen a wide variety of ability to, to integrate the healing. And what happened to me was that I was working on a woman who had her hand smashed in a door and she couldn't close her hand. And uh, she had been in a fight with her husband and there were, you know, door slammed on her hand. And, and so five minutes of quantum touch and she could open her hand. Thank you. But she was still in the relationship and she was still getting beaten up. And I became discouraged because I didn't want to just remove symptoms. I wanted to go deeper. And that's what led me in about 1980 to start exploring the emotional causes. So I had this one morning, I woke up with severe flu symptoms. I mean, really severe, deep, gurgling chest cough, high fever, terrible sore throat, congested, bones aching. I felt the worst. But instead of running into the kitchen to get some hot lemon water, I wrapped a blanket around myself, sat in my meditation spot, and thought, you know, a week ago, a spiritual teacher I'd been working with said that all conditions are emotionally self-induced, primarily due to suppressed anger. So I thought, okay, well, let me look. What am I upset about? Uh, I'm totally numb emotionally. I can't find any emotion at all. So I start looking at my childhood and, you know, every place I can think of finding pain, and I'm numb. I can't feel any emotion at all. And then all of a sudden, after about eight minutes of looking, it just dawned on me that somebody in my household had some, said something in front of a large group of friends intended to cause me to feel humiliated. 
and she had succeeded. I felt humiliated. I don't remember the story anymore, but I definitely felt bad. And at the moment, I tried to suppress the emotion so I wouldn't make it worse by admitting, yeah, that really hurt when you said that. I didn't want to admit it, so I just suppressed it. And interestingly enough, as soon as I had the insight, my whole body had was rushing emotions through me. So I let myself get angry and cry and just vent the intensity of all the emotions I was feeling by letting myself feel what was there. I got up, took, got dressed, took a shower. I mean, took a shower, got dressed, and drove downtown Santa Cruz, where I lived at the time, sat in the sun. I'm drinking a cup of coffee, and I look into the coffee cup, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, I was sick this morning halfway through the coffee. An hour later, I had no symptoms of illness whatsoever. So it took me years, about 30 years, to figure out a complete system for not only helping people find the emotional cause, but how we release it so completely, how we go through all the seven steps of the process to get to the point where you're intensely grateful that you had the condition, because the body had the ability to be sick not as a dysfunction, but as a communication from your higher consciousness on how you would stop loving. That was the ultimate insight. And I called it self-created health. And it's one, that was the fourth major discovery I've had. I concur. Uh, there's always an emotional component in place before any kind of medical condition materializes. And yes. I, that is the most important part of a healing in the work that I do, because I would say, um, we can help you heal body parts all day long. But, yeah. you know, if you still got the emotional thing, why bother? Exactly. It's like your car's not working and you take it into the shop and they put a new radiator in, but you got a dead battery. Well, you just spent all that money, but the car's not going to work still because you can't start it. Well, so I, I completely agree with that. When there's an emotional component and it's identified, is it immediately released once it's illuminated? What's your, what do you suggest? That's the first of seven suggest? steps. That's yeah. the first of seven steps of the process is identifying exactly what the emotional cause is. And it's not paint by number. We have to actually figure it out. So I ask a series of simple interrogative questions. And when the person answers all these questions, I keep pulling more information. Tell me more about the pain. Tell me more about the judgment. Tell me more about, and they keep, I write down their words verbatim. Once I've got a list of 30 or 40 words they use to describe everything about the condition, I say, and you said this started 12 years ago. I said, well, think back around that time of your life. Was there an emotional situation that made you feel, and I read a few of their most graphic replies, like you were being repeatedly stabbed in the back, like you were absolutely hopeless. And I go, yeah, sounds like my relationship with my ex. Well, let's see if it fits. And then I carefully read all 30 or 40 replies one time. Did you feel sad? Did you feel isolated? Did you feel hopeless? You know? And they say, yup, yup, yup. And then I say, what did you do with those emotions? Well, they're the ones I never want to feel. And I slide the list to them and say, well, maybe you're feeling it in your body and not just as an emotion. That's step one of the process where they own it. They go, oh yeah, I see it. I have suppressed these emotions and now I'm feeling them all in my body. Step one, the ownership that that was me. I suppressed it, I did this. The second step is all the release techniques, how to release the hurt, how to release the anger, the shame, the guilt, all that intensity, all the stuff that led to all the fears and all the judgments and everything else. How do we release this and how do we do it for the child, the adolescent, the young adult? How do we process it out of the system? Third step is what I call the dangerous step because if you try to jump to responsibility before you've done the identification and the release, it's like trying to swallow a basketball. It's too big. You can't receive all that at once. And But it's a realization that, yeah, they did it. To, my dad, you know, mom, whoever it was, did this to me. But I've been doing it to myself. I've carried it all these years. Look how I hurt myself and my loved ones. And that leads to the fourth step, which is remorse, which is five or seven minutes of really feeling the pain I caused myself and others. You don't have to hold it very long, but you need to let it in deeply. The next step is the self-forgiveness process where 
you take yourself back again because you rejected yourself all this time. You've been in denial and now you take yourself back and that leads instantly to self-love. This incredible state of self-love and if you take it all the way to the seventh step, the self-love becomes uncontainable, overwhelming self-love, unfathomable. I compare it to like five grams of mushrooms, but it's like, ah, that whole, wholly overwhelming connection to self. And then when they get there, they're intensely grateful that they had had the condition because the condition showed them how they'd stopped loving. And to, as one woman put it, to get back to the love of my father was so worth it because I'd been, you know, rejecting him and my love for him all those years. What was the condition that triggered all that? Oh, my shoulder hurt. And everybody laughs because the shoulder is nothing that she had been struggling with for a decade compared to getting back to the love of dad. And this is where it all goes. It, it's all about love. It was always only about love. And as people are able to get to that space, then they reconnect and that's it. That's what it's all about. How does this concept of there's always an emotional component apply when we're talking about babies and children and they come in with some horrible illness or yeah. disease or something like that? How does that work? Because the children are willing to go along with the parents' agenda. So here's a really good story about that. These parents had a child who was um, deeply developmentally um, bad, what do you call it, um, like Down syndrome. And a spiritual teacher I worked with worked with these, these parents and pointed out to them, isn't it interesting coincidence that both of you are instructors you know, you both work with children with Down syndrome and then pointed out to them how each of them had blockages within themselves that made them feel like they wouldn't be acceptable parents to anybody who was cognitive. So the only way they felt like they could be good parents were if the child had Down syndrome. So they get, the teacher gave them both homework and they did the emotional process work of healing themselves to the point where they could mentally and verbally talked to the child and said, look, we love you so much. And if you want to come out of this inner world that you're in and be cognitive, we're going to love you the way you are. And if you come out, we're going to love you that way too. But we give you permission to be bright and intelligent now and live in the world with us because we're healed enough now. By the time the child was ready to enter the first grade, he entered on his, on his grade level. So it was a cooperation with the parents because the parent and the child were cooperating. The child said, that's how you want me? Okay, that's fine. I'll be this way. I'll be broken, but you'll love me broken. That's how we'll do it. And the parent said, no, we did decide that originally, but we're giving you permission now to come out and be more. And the child said, okay, I'll be more. So it was an agreement. Now, this is not going to go over well with a lot of people, but this is how it works. And if the parents are willing to take responsibility and heal their brokenness, the child doesn't have to exhibit their brokenness. But it's an agreement between parent and child. And if the child wants to leave early, well, on to the next life. I don't have an agenda to stay in this one. Let's move on to the next one. I have a story about a Downs baby, too. Yeah. I have a friend whose daughter was pregnant with a Downs baby. She had two amnios. Mm. I scanned her. I could tell it was a Downs baby. They yeah. have a look that you can be identified. Yeah. And the parents were very accepting. And they said, we're going to, the doctors wanted them to abort. They said, no, we're going to raise the baby. Uh, they found support groups, all of yeah. this while, she, while the daughter's pregnant. That baby came out, Richard. 
He didn't have Downs. Wow. Baffled the daylights out of the doctors. The doctors were saying, how can this be? Two tests, other tests, Mm -hmm. whatever. And so my friend's calling me from the hospital after she delivered and they got her all settled. She goes, what the heck? And I said, that baby didn't need to be born Downs because the parents accepted the baby, regardless of how he was going to be born. And now he's, I don't know, eight or nine and no cognitive issues at all. So that goes right along with what you're talking about. Another thing was this woman who, she and her husband were both quantum touch instructors and she was a social worker. And she came to the judge one day and said, this baby was born 13 weeks prematurely with severe fetal alcohol syndrome, a prognosis of a 20 to 40 IQ, and addicted to amphetamines. And she said, can I raise this baby? Because otherwise it's just gonna spend its life in an institution. And the judge said, yes, take it home and and raise it as your own. So she and her husband knew how to use quantum touch. They're both instructors. So when the baby got strong enough that it could actually move its limbs and cry, because it was just skin and bones, it's little tiny nothing, Terry would pick up the baby when he'd cry in the morning, little tiny thing, and he'd run energy into the baby. And the baby would stop crying and wait patiently for him to make the food for the baby, raise the formula. And he realized that the baby had a higher priority for energy than it had for food. And then once the the child got old enough, when he was like two and three, he was average height and weight. He became above average intelligence. And then one day when he was about four and a half, he was jumping from the couch to couch as as little boys will do. And he banged his head on the wooden part of the couch. And he's crying and crying and Terry, he starts running energy using quantum touch into the baby's head. And the little boy says, that feels good. And he said, well, it's supposed to feel good. And then the baby starts taking his hands and doing this. He says, what do you see? He says, I see light. He said, what's it look like? This looks like flashlights. And he's seen the energy. And then his mother tested him the same way I tested Rosalind Briere to see if she could see energy. And they both saw exact, they could see the chakra colors when she was meditating on the chakras. And he grew up to be above average intelligence with average height and weight with no symptoms at all of severe fetal alcohol syndrome. So the bottom line is we don't know the limits of what's possible. And until people are willing to study the non-physical elements of who and what we are, we are deceiving ourselves to believe that the limits that other people have put on us are truly our limits. I agree. Everything can be healed. And even sometimes the healing is death. Yes. I tell people that. They're they're done. They're ready to go. They're on to the next adventure yeah. and do that. I've read that. I, I've read this a couple of times and it, it doesn't resonate with me. So I'd love to hear your take on this. I've read that our energy can affect up to 750 people. I don't think that there's a limit to it. So how does somebody increase their energy field? Well, it's very easy. The basic quantum touch teaches how to use breathing and body awareness. And um, there's no limit to how many people you can impact. It's just a belief system. And as people identify as being bigger and bigger, you know, it was funny because I, I demonstrated a place called the Smart Life Forum that I could align people. And somebody said, well, can you do the whole room? I said, yes, yeah, anybody not want to be aligned? Nobody raised their hand. All right, everybody stand up. And then I took like 15 or 20 seconds to kind of look around the room and make a real mental note to include every single person here. So I'm looking at everybody, trying to say yes, yes, yes to every single person. That was the hard part. Then the second step was to join everybody in my mind into one iconic person, like a mannequin kind of thing. Okay, I got my one iconic person. Now that I've done that, I can just do the session. And I line the sphenoid bone in one second. And about 10 or 12 people in the room go, oh my God, my neck stopped hurting or my 
my back feels better, or I, my sinuses opened up, or my headache is gone. And all these people started blurting out, like, oh my God, they feel different. And we measured a lot of people, and they're all aligned. But we don't, a hundred, a thousand, it doesn't matter. It's just a matter of using love and intention and the skills of being able to move energy. And all these people write all this silly stuff. Like you read a book on pranic healing. It says, don't work on eyes. It's too powerful. That's silly. Don't work on infants because it's too energizing. And people create these limitations. But they're just made, something somebody made up who is coming from fear. And we don't need to carry this fear around at all. We can just work with the love and the energy. Oh my God, you love me too much. I'm going to break. I'm going to explode. That's just silly. There's no li limit to how much love. Maybe there's a limit to how much they can receive. And we're always going to be expanding our potential for feeling and experiencing more love. And that's what the challenge is of my new workshop is how much can you be changed by the love? How much can your beliefs open up? How much of another person's joy and gratitude can you let in at any moment? How much of the negative ego can we heal so we have no, in no inclination to feel the suffering that we were so used to before? So we're going to let learn to let the past go. And that's what this new one's going to be about. Do you believe that it's possible for energy healing to hurt somebody? Piggybacking on what you just said, is it is it possible that it can cause harm? I've never seen it. Um, people may experience like a temporary pain. Like, for instance, if you're working on, I was working on a woman who had her thumb smashed in a car door, and I started running energy and going, oh, it really hurts. Yeah, it does temporarily a little bit. And then I, so I started slowing down just breathing less and doing less energy until she could acclimate to the new vibration. And after about half an hour, it really stopped hurting. I kept running the energy and then she, oh my God, it doesn't hurt anymore. After about an hour, I was at a lecture. So I was just holding her thumb during this whole lecture. And by the end of the lecture, her thumb didn't hurt at all. But yes, you may, like for burns, it may hurt more when you start running the energy in, but you're not hurting a person. It's that the process of the healing may actually bring up some pain temporarily, but it's a very temporary process. I've never seen anybody harmed from a session. I did see somebody throw up one time, but that was, that was needed. I've seen people go to sleep or become more awake as a result of it, but I've never seen anybody harmed from the energy. The harm could only come if an untrained person was just nasty but I've never seen anybody using the energy and harming another. I don't believe it's possible. I don't either. I believe that it's spirit working through us and with us and spirit's pure love and joy. Yeah. And so it's not a possibility. And so I tell my students, you know, all doctors take the Hippocratic oath, do no harm. You don't need to worry about it with this because we can't do any harm. Yeah, I Number don't... one, all we can do is send the energy to the client and the client decides if or how they're going to integrate it. So yeah, we're on the same I page. Say, I say, you, you know, don't worry about that. It's been my experience that energy, when I'm working with somebody on a healing, it's going to go where it's most needed first. Yeah. And in some instances, somebody will say, yeah, my ankle really hurts and I'll get them on my radar. I'm, I'm like a human MRI. I can yeah. see body parts in my mind's mm -hmm. eye. And sometimes, let's say it's their left ankle that's injured. And sometimes the energy will go to their right ankle first. And they'll say, that's not the one that's injured. I said, but that's the one doing the heavy lifting. So the energy is fortifying that one first before we go over and we work on the one that is in need of the the healing to get it whole again. Have you experienced that as well? Oh, absolutely. We call it body and spiritual intelligence does the healing. And so I've got this very complex co technique called chasing the pain. So somebody has a migraine headache. So an 11 year old in class is holding her head. And then she says, well, I feel it on my throat now. Well, the energy moves. And so she, the 11 year old goes to the throat, runs energy in the throat. She says, well, now I feel it all like in the liver gallbladder. So the 11 year old goes there and now the headache is gone. 
we call it chasing the pain. You go from point A to B, C, and so forth. And a woman in the class said, well, I'm an acupuncturist, and I know why some headaches are liver gallbladder. I said, yes, you do. But this, this boy in the class, he didn't know anything about that. He's just going where she's feeling the energy, and the energy will move from place to place as the body intelligence and spiritual intelligence decides where things need to go. I agree. Research has shown, I just got a couple more questions. Research has shown the placebo effect can be up to 50% in clinical studies. And I understand the rigors of clinical studies because as an inventor of surgical devices, I've had to run them in order to get my devices approved by the FDA yes. and, and similar governing entities in other countries. So do you believe that the placebo effect is part of the energy healing process? This is a really interesting question. The placebo shows us how capable the body is of extraordinary healing, but it's, it's set off by a false belief, let's call it, a belief that you received the medication, whatever it is. What's exciting about energy healing is we can trigger that same body self-healing mechanism, but we don't need to use deception in order to trigger it. So the body has this extraordinary healing ability, and we can tap in on that extraordinary healing ability by energy rather than a false belief. Yep, I agree. You've talked at length about how cancer is caused by suppressed anger in a lot of instances. Yeah. I find that cancer patients, especially women, are very good at at, res at giving, not good at all at receiving. Can you talk a little bit about the anger yeah. part of the equation and also the receiving and giving part? Mm -hmm. and, and so what I tell these women is, look, you're being forced to receive by your medical providers, by your family, perhaps by your colleagues at mm -hmm. work. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on cancer in particular and yeah. anger. You know, I, I did some research and there's medical names for cancer patients, terms they use like too good to be true, prince of a fellow, the nicest person in the world. And it turns out that the people with cancer who get angry at the cancer and angry at their doctor and angry about everything in their life, they're the ones who tend to survive the longest. And doctors, when looking at cancer cells, the most virulent, dangerous cancer cells look, quote, I read an article about this, look angry under the microscope. So the suppression of an active emotion of anger will express itself in the body. And so what I find necessary is that people can learn to not be afraid of the intensity of their emotion. And people who have suppressed it, like, like a breast cancer, what does the breast do? It's nurturing, it's how you might receive love, it's sexual, it's all kinds of different things. It's providing food. But if your femininity has been suppressed or, your, or the anger about being a woman or an anger about how you've been treated is so deep, maybe you'd express it in the breast tissue. And so by willingness to just not hold back, to feel all the intensity and then turn it all into love, because you've learned how to release the anger and the hurt and the shame and the guilt and the fears and all that stuff, and then take yourself back again and love yourself so intensely and deeply, your body doesn't have, your higher self doesn't have the need to express those emotions as illness anymore. And then with energy and good nutrition, your body can do extraordinary self-healing. And so, it all comes down to the bigger picture that we've been talking about the whole time. Honesty, what Jiminy Cricket said, honesty is the best policy. The truth shall set you free, whatever it is, JC, Jiminy Cricket or Jesus. It's all coming back to that core honesty, vulnerability, release of the emotions, being able to receive the love, be able to express the love and come back to yourself. And ultimately, it's an incredible gift that you gave yourself if you're willing to get to the other side of it. But it's very vulnerable, and it takes people all the way to the edge. Is there a quick technique that you can show us that everybody 
that's listening or watching can do? Yeah. What you can do is, this is really simple, but if you hold up a finger, can you feel sensation in your finger if you bring all your attention to your finger? Maybe breathe more deeply as if you're breathing through the finger. Can you feel the skin? Can you feel any vibration? Can you feel a little tingling in the finger? Can you imagine you're stroking the finger with a feather? A little imaginary feather. Can you, can you feel it whether you're stroking the feather on top of your finger? Can you feel underneath your fingernail? Can you feel that? Now what you're doing is you're bringing awareness to that finger and you're making more sensation inside that finger. This is the first step of learning to move energy through your entire body. You're going to want to learn how to move it through every inch of your body. It activates all the energy centers, the chakras of your body. It grounds you. It protects you energetically when you're doing a healing session so you don't tend to match the other person's energy. It raises your vibration. And by using that simple energy awareness and body awareness, you can lift yourself up so you never match the other person's energy and you keep raising it higher and higher. So that's a first step in learning how to run the energy with quantum touch. Terrific. What's the ultimate purpose of life? Why do we incarnate? I think we're learning how to consciously create the reality, how to consciously create fun. And in these incarnations that we have, we're learning how to grow spiritually. And one of the things that I'm so excited about my new seminar, because it taps into this exactly, we're learning how to heal the negative ego of self-importance and self-pity. It causes us to live in the moment and how to have intensely more fun in your life. Because out of all the thousands of flavors of love, and maybe I haven't let in a whole ton of them, and I start receiving them from other people, I can consciously have, I can fulfill my chosen destiny of allowing myself to receive more love, of being much happier, and fulfilling the things that I want to do without the negative ego of the pain body of self-pity and self-importance to let myself ex experience the incredible potential joy in this lifetime. So I think that's why we're here. We're here to grow spiritually and to fulfill those chosen destinies. I agree. People ask me all the time, what's my life's purpose? What am I supposed to be doing this round? I say, you're supposed to be creating. And they mm -hmm. say, create what? I said, whatever you're interested in. I mean, certainly there we're interested in different things at different stages in our life. That's number one is to create. And number two is to create in joy. Follow your bliss. What's fun for you? Do yeah. stuff that's fun. And I say, we never finish creating. You think about it. We create when we get out of bed in the morning. What are we going to wear? Where, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? You, we create all day long. And then when we're done with this life, what do we do? We die. We go back to heaven. We create our next life. Yeah. So it never ends. And it's all, at the end of the day, it's all about joy. I, I completely agree with you. How can people learn more about you and your work? Uh, go to quantumtouch.com. If they get on the mailing list, we give them a whole bunch of freebies and free books and things. And people can, can learn to do this stuff. And if they learn some basic quantum touch, they can come to my uh, retreat in October where I'm going to show how we can actually share the gifts with each other directly. And it's the most transformational thing I've ever experienced. Wonderful. Yeah. All righty, everybody. That's it for this week. Sending you lots of love. Mwah. Thank from you. Sweet Home, Alabama, and from Mexico, where Richard is. Yes. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Julie on Instagram and YouTube at Ask Julie Ryan. And like her on Facebook at Ask Julie Ryan. To schedule an appointment or submit a question, please visit AskJulieRyan.com.
This show is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be medical, psychological, financial, or legal advice. Please contact a licensed professional. The Ask Julie Ryan Show, Julie Ryan and all parties involved in producing, recording, and distributing it assume no responsibility for listeners' actions based on any information heard on this or any Ask Julie Ryan shows or podcasts.